So I start to say something, maybe. <clears throat> oh, you think after 40 events, I would remember to turn on the microphone, but no, uh, I am slow of mind. So hello, everybody, welcome. Whoops. <laughs> and you think I turn on the video too. But here we go. Uh, welcome back to Red May, your one month vacation from capitalism, 43 events, 110 speakers. We are now down to our final, final six events. So you better hurry to catch all of them. Of course, we're about to hear rethinking the Chinese cultural revolution. Um, if you stick around today to 3 a.m., or at least come back at 3 a.m., you will be able to hear Veronica Gago in conversation with Michael Hart and Kathy Weeks on her new book, Feminist International, How to Change Everything. And certainly everything does need to be changed. Now, on Monday, we, we, we take no rest. We continue onward with two more events. At 11 a.m., Marks for Cats, a radical bestiary uh, with Lee Claire LaBerge and her cats. And uh, Max Haven, I found out, is going to be the moderator. So uh, bring your cats and watch this event. Should be fascinating. And then uh, on, what do we got? We got 6 p.m. Theory of the gimmick, aesthetic judgment and capitalist form that is of course uh, the name of the book, the third part of a trilogy by Sian Nagai, the brilliant literary theorist and left writer. She will be in conversation with Christopher Nealon, a poet, critic, all around wonderful gentleman. And so we go to Tuesday where we have one event on Tuesday, neither vertical nor horizontal. Uh, there is a legend about that event. It was filmed sometime in the morning, an early morning at three, four o'clock, four a.m. Uh, has only been broadcast live to Europe and the rest of the world. We are now rebroadcasting this event sometime on uh, Tuesday. So uh, check out our Facebook page to find out when. It, it'll be a big surprise. It's, it's that hip an event. You have to go find the time yourself. And then Wednesday, our last event is our first live event of Red May as a leading into the hopefully a live Red May next year. This is in Mossman Park in the Bay Area. And it's a conversation with Joy James, Idris Robinson, Shimon Salem, and Wendy Trevino. And it's called on the George Floyd uprising and the agency of abolition. It's at 3 p.m. And then we will bid you adieu until next year. But the ability of ourselves, our collective, to put on this madness again next year, which we all very much wanna do, will depend on raising more money. So we've gotta raise a lot in the last week. Uh, the way we do that is you go to donate, on www.redmayseattle.org uh, and you can uh, contribute to our GoFundMe, Fan the Frames of Red May, or uh, you can become a patron. Uh, $5, $3, $5, $10, $20 on Patreon. It is a very 18th century feel. But Lord, I'm a patron of Red May, etc. So uh, really, depending on your cultural tastes, you can, you can do anything. But you must do something. We really don't get any institutional funding, uh, a commie event like this. So we have to depend on the kindness of strangers. Uh, so be generous and enjoy what we have to offer. I'm very excited now to uh, introduce, uh, uh, or at least introduce the introducer uh, to an event uh, uh, built around this wonderful pathbreaking book by. Uh, Alessandro Russo called Cultural Revolution and Revolutionary Culture. I don't know if you can see on my iPad, but there it is. The book is upstairs somewhere in some kind of pile of books, which as Assad can attest is so large that it, if there was an earthquake to a care, I would die when it fell down on my head. 
uh, I'm happy to, uh, to welcome back also uh, Red May's uh, perennial attender and uh, one of our presiding spirits, Saad Haider, who you know, of course, as the co-founder of Viewpoint and the author of the wonderful book, uh, Mistaken Identity, Assad. Welcome back to Red May again. Hello, Philip. Thank you. Uh, very pleased uh, to be doing this panel. Um, I think that this is going to be extremely interesting. Uh, as Philip said, we are talking about um, the Cultural Revolution broadly, but with the uh, springboard of Alessandro Russo's book, I have the physical copy here, uh, Cultural Revolution and Revolutionary Culture. And Alessandro has been uh, writing on this topic for many years. And this, so this is a, uh, it's a really important event that we have it all together in one book. It's a very original uh, analysis of the history. Um, and also um, it's a, uh, uh, I think a, a theoretical work, which is of interest to people um, who are not simply uh, reading Chinese history, the, the, of people who are, uh, just broadly interested in uh, the history of uh, communist politics and theory. And uh, we should mention that uh, one of our panelists, Andrea, is uh, not able to attend because uh, weather disasters have knocked out the uh, uh, access to uh, the internet. Um, so hopefully we will be able to hear uh, from her at another time. So uh, we have uh, Alessandro, and then as another commentator, we have Chris Connery, um, who is um, a uh, uh, who, who is who has spent a lot of time in China, talking as much as he can about the Cultural Revolution to the extent that that's possible. He's participated in uh, uh, the uh, workers' theater projects uh, in China and has recently written uh, on the World Factory for uh, the China story. And so he will also be commenting uh, on the book and on the Cultural Revolution more generally. I'm told I have to mention that, the, that when Philip said that the Veronica Gago uh, conversation was at 3 a.m., that was an error. It is at 3 p.m. Uh, more recently. Okay, so that's the business. And so we're going to start with uh, Alessandro. So we'll pass it over to you. Unmute. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Assad. <laughs> and thank you, the organizers of, uh, of this uh, online seminar. I am <clears throat> very happy to be with you and uh, to discuss with you. You, Assad, have written a, a long uh, analysis of the book and uh, you have pointed to the some important theoretical problem, I have much appreciated your 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 your, your essay with the Chris Connery. We have a, a, a discussion since, since many many years on this subject and other subject concerning contemporary China. So there are the best condition to. To, to discuss uh, uh, some aspects of my book. I, I don't want to, to introduce the book. Maybe you can do this much better than, than me. Uh, I would like to, to start, uh, well, you asked me when, when I uh, started to, to, to write this book, where the origins of this book are probably uh, when I was a student with Cloud. <laughs> we were in China in, uh, in the last two years of the Cultural Revolution, 74, 76, we were students at Peking University. Uh, so we have the possibility to follow some political and uh, way social events at that moment. Uh, we traveled a lot, we discussed with a lot of people and uh, we, um, we, we <laughs> have the, we learned a lot from from the, those two years in China, and uh, although after 60, 76, 78, uh, there was a total negation of the Cultural Revolution, we have also uh, continued to 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 think that um, uh, it we was important did. to find maybe another angle of attack <laughs> to 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 discuss. Uh, the, the, the issue of, of the Cultural Revolution. So 
this book is, of course, the, the result of a, a certain <laughs> process of research. Uh, um, and, uh, well, I, I don't, uh, I will not introduce some elements of the book. Uh, culture, revolution, revolutionary culture, in short, is uh, uh, the, the two elements that I isolated to, 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 to discuss, to, to find maybe another, another perspective on the cultural revolution. Now, I would like to start from um, something that Philip wrote me, that he was uh, delighted to, uh, uh, to discuss uh, a taboo subject you know, as the Cultural Revolution. I am delighted to discuss a taboo subject. And I would uh, say also that uh, taboo, as uh, Freud uh, taught us, uh, is uh, the censorship of a strong desire. So we, we, must, <laughs> we must clarify a bit uh, what uh, uh, is this desire, which is the content of this political desire. So, of course, we wanted to rethink the Cultural Revolution, and I propose to start from a point that can give us some elements about our distance from the Cultural Revolution. How far is from us the Cultural Revolution? So I, I would focus on a specific uh, um, moment, a specific point about uh, well, what, what was really Mao's political project uh, at the, the, the eve of the Cultural Revolution, before the, the, the mass movement? Assad, you have uh, mm, uh, analyzed very well the, all the issue of pluralization, dismissal, etc., all the, all the, 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 the mm -hmm. enigmatic process uh, now that uh, uh, transformed these uh, enormous uh, <clears throat> uh, rise of uh, independent organization into uh, the factionalist struggle, etc. Well, I, I will start a bit, a little bit before, on the eve of the mass uh, stage of the Cultural Revolution. What was the Mao's uh, political project? For example, mid-May 66, now uh, Cultural Revolution, the mass uh, um, phase of the Cultural Revolution starts uh, more or less uh, beginning of June. So uh, what was the political project of Mao in, in, in mid-May? So uh, I, I propose to think that uh, uh, Mao's uh, uh, political project had two aspects. One was uh, critical, destructive, and one was uh, uh, affirmative, constructive. The critical and destructive aspect and the positive affirmative aspect are uh, expressed in the two famous documents of, of May 66. One is the uh, 16 May circular that is considered maybe the first political document of the Cultural Revolution that absolutely contains the critical aspect, the destructive aspect. Um, but the destruction of what was not, uh, in general, the destruction of the old world, the old idea, no, not at all. Was the, cre the, the <laughs> what the, in, in the book is written as the shrinking of the cultural superego, uh, in other terms, to reduce the, 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 the power, the authority of the cultural apparatuses of the state. Mao wanted, uh, uh, Mao aimed at a a, a deep rethinking of the essence of socialism. He considered socialism a, 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 an experimental exception to capitalism. But uh, uh, um, he, since mid fifties, uh, he considered absolutely indispensable to uh, rethink uh, the, uh, the essence of this exception. Uh, he dis did not, uh, uh, <clears throat> was not satisfied from the, the, the Soviet model. He wanted to find another, another path. And uh, he, he hoped that uh, this uh, uh, rethinking of, uh, of the essence of the socialist exception was the object of a mass debate. Well, in uh, mid 60s, uh, in, in, uh, since the end of 65, uh, <clears throat> and uh, early 66, Mao realized that uh, 
the main obstacle to a mass debate uh, about the essence of the, of, the, of the socialism were the cultural apparatuses of the state. The cultural apparatus of the state were uh, what Mao called polemically the, 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 the palace of, uh, of the king of hell, no, the, the palace of the king of hell that um, uh, imposes their, 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 uh, their censorship, their preemptive censorship about all political debates about the, the destinies of socialism, what Mao also called in his term, the probable defeat of socialism, etc. Uh, so this is uh, the, the, the critical aspect, you know, it is all, often said that the cultural revolution started to tyrannize intellectually. This is not true. The first, the first targets of cultural revolution were not intellectuals, were the, uh, uh, the, 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 the highest leader of the palace of the king of hell, the, the highest leader of the cultural uh, uh, apparatus of the state that in China <coughs> exerted a, 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 a highly repressive function. No? This, it was not true in China, the distinction, and in the socialist state in general, the distinction between the, uh, the, the, the ideological apparatuses and the, the uh, repressive apparatus, as Althusser said no? about uh, the distinction in the, in the, in the, in the contemporary state. In China and in the socialist states in general, uh, uh, the ideological apparatuses were also repressive apparatuses, and in particular hindered any possible uh, re, uh, rethinking of the, uh, the, 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 the the true essence of the, 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 the socialist exception. For, for, for Mao, uh, socialism was not, uh, a, a sort of, uh, of stage in, uh, in the development of history that from capitalism <laughs> brings to the communism. No? Socialism was an exception, an, ex an, ex an experimental exception. Uh, and uh, an experimental exception and the capitalism was the rule of modern world. So uh, if this experimental exception was not constantly renewed, it was a test in the two to, to go back to the riverbed to, of, of capitalism. So Mao often said, it is very easy in China to make capitalism. It was true. And it has, it has been very easy to, to make capitalism in China, no? because socialism was the exception. So this is uh, one, one aspect uh, the, the, the uh, Mao was very <clears throat> concerned about uh, the uh, obstacles to rethinking the the, the nature of this exception. So the first target were uh, coherently were the cultural apparatuses of the state. But besides this critical aspect, the critical element of his, of his project, there was an affirmative element. In the same uh, days, uh, in uh, <clears throat> about the 7th of, of May, he wrote another text that at the moment was quite famous it is called, uh, the title is quite solemn, the, the directive, the 7th May directive. It was in fact a letter, a letter to Limbiao. And uh, this letter was uh, in, in fact a, a sort of, a, I would say a sort of educational program, a program of a, a, a pedagogical pro project you know, for the cultural revolution. Uh, but really it, it, it's very, um, peculiar pedagogical problem. He says that the basic, uh, the, the main theme of this, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, text is make uh, uh, the society a great school. So the, 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 the first uh, uh, po affirmative no, project of Mao at, on the eve of the mass phase of cultural revolution was to make uh, the society a great school, in which sense? He said, it's very specific, the, the, the argument that Mao <coughs> raised in this, in this text. He, he was a letter that start uh, with uh, uh, proposing that the army, uh, the People's Liberation Army, uh, became a sort of model in, the, in China, a model of uh, overcoming the social barriers 
of the division of labor. So he proposed that the army, the soldiers, <clears throat> besides the, their ordinary military duties, also uh, uh, were uh, workers, peasants, they studied theory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And on the same time, he proposed that workers also became soldiers and peasants and study theories. And the peasants become uh, uh, workers and soldiers and study theories, and the students, of course. So the idea of uh, 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 overcoming no, the social barrier, the social division of labor, and in a sense to deepen a, 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 a communist project. This was, in a sense, a quite uh, classical communist project since Marx, uh, the idea that, that the essence of communism was to overcome the social division of labor and that the social division of labor was the basis of any uh, class division in society of any inequities in, in the contemporary society, it was, uh, uh, well, uh, in, in this sense, Mao's uh, uh, argument was quite classical. But there, there, there is another aspect that is uh, uh, <clears throat> connected to, the, to, the, to, the, to that very moment, mid-66. In the beginning of this letter, he says, even in the, uh, uh, in the case of a third world war, uh, the army must uh, must uh, 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 become a model of uh, this uh, uh, movement of uh, making the society a great school. So this is very important in that moment. In that moment, the possibility of a, 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 an extension of, for example, the Vietnam War. No, it was the moment where really the, the possibility risk. The risk that the Vietnam War uh, was the, well, developing into, into a large scale uh, world war was, was, was a real risk. On the other hand, uh, the Soviet Union uh, made pressure to reestablish uh, uh, political and uh, military links uh, with, uh, with the Communist, Chinese Communist Party uh, and uh, to establish a, 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 an alliance uh, against the United States to, to, to make war to the United States. And there, are, there were also uh, important military, uh, military and political leaders in the Communist Party that, that uh, were convinced that it was uh, inevitable to, to make an alliance with the Soviet Union against the United States. Fortunately, Mao opposed strongly to this, uh, to this, uh, uh, to this uh, strategy and on the contrary insisted to make the, uh, the, the, the army no, the model of the, uh, a movement for overcoming the, 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 the division of labor. So, in a moment when it was uh, really possible a, 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 a large-scale war, he proposed, a, on the contrary, a great politicization of a Chinese society and a sort of demilitarization of the army. Yeah? Demilitarization of the army. The, the army should also have military, uh, civilian functions. You know? So I think that uh, I, I, I quote this, this, this element just to, <laughs> to give a sense of, of the distance from the present time. You know? uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we, we, we don't see in China today any, any sign of uh, a project of uh, overcoming the uh, social division of labor. Any sign of uh, uh, <clears throat> reduce the militaristic reach of the army. <clears throat> so which are today you know, the, the elements, the, 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 the factors that can prevent uh, uh, the participation of China to a large scale war? This is a 
for me, eh? it's, a, it's, a, it's a big question that uh, uh, concerns me a lot. When I see that also uh, some, some uh, critical intellectuals are so uh, fell in love of state's capacity, but state's capacity is the capacity of state to be separated from the, from the society. No, is, mm -hmm. is the, the capacity of state to be a, 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 a bureaucratic military machinery separate from the state, from the from society and uh, uh, ready to be involved in a war. So in a, in, in a sense, I, when I see to the, uh, at the uh, look at the distance from the Cultural Revolution, uh, I am a bit pessimistic. I'm a bit pessimistic <laughs> because I don't see the elements that can really prevent uh, the participation of China to a large scale war. So I would uh, limit my intervention to this uh, marginal element that I, <clears throat> in any case, I consider important uh, for uh, our reflection on Chinese uh, modern politics and also in the contemporary situation. So I stop now and I can answer to uh, to, to, to your questions, uh, uh, and thank you for it. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> a few comments for me, and then we'll go to Chris. Um, this is an interesting entry point into what I wanted to say, or the way I wanted to frame uh, my points, which is uh, the distance from the Cultural Revolution, but then also how we today can relate to this history. What is our relationship to the history of the 20th century revolutions and to the history of state socialism? And of course, you know, as uh, Sandro mentioned that Philip said, we are talking about a taboo topic in the sense that uh, there is a general understanding of the whole history of state socialism as a disaster and a, a failure. And uh, the Cultural Revolution is uh, in many ways uh, the, uh, the, the, the example that's reached for the most often to describe disaster. I was just thinking of this line of Alain Baidu, uh, better a disaster than non-being, which is a, in French, it's a kind of a pun. Um, and uh, this is interesting to think about um, because it is the recognition that the standard liberal narrative uh, the, that we have about this history is one that prefers non-being in the sense that it prefers nothing to happen and it prefers no idea. But at the same time, it is a recognition that disasters were real. Uh, there really were disasters and uh, there really was failure. And one of the interesting things about this book is uh, how there is a very considerable attention to trying to understand why the Cultural Revolution uh, devolved into factionalism. And Alessandro mentioned that I have written uh, about this theme. I'm going to think now about some different themes. Um, the others will speak, uh, will get more into the history, Chinese history. Uh, I'm not uh, an expert on China and I'm going to speak in terms of theory in such a way that I think can bridge from this material to many listeners who also uh, don't have um, a particular background in that history. So this is a question of our relationship to the history of state socialism, to the history of revolutionary politics and understanding how our moment seems completely framed by failure uh, and, the, and a kind of impossibility of politics. Uh, we, it's, it's very hard for us to conceive of social change on the scale that happened throughout the 20th century with, with the great revolutions. And much of that has to do with the difficulty we have in uh, simultaneously understanding the new possibilities they brought about and how they came to an end. And this is the difficult task. Uh, and I think that this uh, case study is a good way to understand it. So in terms of the theoretical approach, um, the, Sandro has 
relied on um, Althusser for some important theoretical points in the book. Althusser wrote uh, an article on the Cultural Revolution in 1966. It was published in the Marxist-Leninist notebooks of his students. It was anonymously published. And he said, uh, the importance of the Cultural Revolution is its theoretical interest. He emphasized the theoretical interest of the Cultural Revolution. And he said that it, it is uh, responding to a political conjuncture, but it's not a specifically Chinese conjuncture, and it's not even a global conjuncture. It is a, the political conjuncture of socialism and of the uh, problems faced by any socialist country. And so he said at that time, he said that um, the, the central thesis of the Cultural Revolution was that of regression. There was a possibility that uh, there could be a, a revolution uh, that in, and you could have a socialist country, but that it was possible to regress back into capitalism. And what this meant was that the uh, orthodox and classical uh, uh, interpretation of Marxism, which saw socialism as the result of historical laws guaranteed by the unfolding of history could no longer be maintained. If there is a possibility of regression, then the, the, the temporality is not linear and it's not uh, simply progressive. There is no guarantee. And um, so he argued this, uh, he makes the thesis of regression and then he inserts it into this uh, analysis of the different levels of society, the economic, political, and ideological levels, and very much associates the Cultural Revolution with the ideological level. And of course, this was a very standard view of the new left, uh, and so in many um, kind of accounts of the Cultural Revolution, it's implied by the name of the Cultural Revolution that this was about a struggle in the superstructure and that that is the uh, significance of it. But I think that um, there's something about this understanding of history and what the Cultural Revolution meant about history uh, that is even more primary than that. And so uh, one point is that the, the, the title of this book, Cultural Revolution, Revolutionary Culture, is pointing to attention, uh, which is, Culture is playing the role here, not of the site in which the, in the class struggle is carried on, class struggle and superstructure, but revolutionary culture is describing what we can just use uh, the other terms of Althusser here. It's describing the existing problematic uh, of revolution. And it is a problematic which is structured around uh, uh, categories like class struggle, the seizure of state power, uh, and so on. And uh, so the Cultural Revolution is uh, what is throwing the um, revolutionary culture into question. Uh, it's a re-examination of the existing revolutionary culture, which is proposing something different about politics, a different understanding about politics, and a different understanding of history. So with Althusser, we had the thesis of regression, but what is emphasized uh, in this book is a different point that uh, came from Mao, and it was a, a series of comments that are quoted from, I think, 1965 to 1967, uh, revolving around uh, the category of the probable defeat. And uh, I think, uh, for me, this is a very key theoretical uh, proposition uh, because revolutionary culture was based around, once again, the uh, guarantee of the achievement of socialism, of the inevitable victory. The laws of history uh, will lead to the victory of socialism. Now, when you have the idea of regression, you problematize that linear kind of conception, but the probable defeat is something different the idea that the most likely outcome is that we will be defeated. And so there are these sort of remarkable uh, quotes from Mao where he says, uh, one of them, my health is quite good, but Marx will eventually invite me to visit him. Uh, and then he goes on to say, the, the most likely possibility is that revisionism will come about. And he says, putting this probability as the first to take place, I'm, I too am distressed. 
and uh, most probably revisionism will win out and we will be defeated. Through the probable defeat, we will arouse everyone's attention. So the idea here that, you know, uh, the, the Althusserian critique was that you cannot talk about a direction to history. Here, there is a kind of direction to history, which is a bad one, because the most likely outcome is defeat. And that is a distinct and rather interesting proposition, and one which uh, it's difficult not to relate to in our historical moment <laughs> that the, the most likely outcome is defeat. But then that is the reason why there is a necessity of uh, political struggle. And so this uh, different proposition about history, I think it frames uh, two other problems uh, within uh, revolutionary culture that are exposed uh, by the cultural revolution. And we can also associate them in some senses with slogans that come from Mao. Uh, one of them you know, was made, uh, as far as I know, first in 1962, but constantly repeated during the Cultural Revolution, never forget the class struggle. Now, uh, it's a rather extraordinary thing to say, uh, which, and you'll find the argument in the book that class struggle was a limit on the possibility of socialism. And that is a counterintuitive claim for uh, many people. Uh, but it is, I think, one of the very important arguments here that class uh, as a social category could not serve as the basis for emancipatory politics. There was no expression between the sociological category of class and the politics of emancipation. And that was uh, directly true um, in a concrete sense uh, in the context of state socialism, because class categories had become scrambled by the changes in the, uh, ownership and the changes in the division of labor and so on. Uh, but there's also, this is also a political question, and this is related to the events in Shanghai in 1967. Uh, the January storm and the Shanghai Commune, which these are among the most bewildering historical events I've ever studied. Uh, so I, I won't speak about the actual history, but it's a it is a case when the there was no unitary expression of class categories in a politics, uh, and so one could not derive emancipatory politics from class categories, and. This it poses an interesting question because when we look now at politics, uh, on the one hand, we have to deal with the fact that class struggle presented a limit on the uh, emancipatory potential within state socialism. And that is the history, that is the historical limit we have inherited. On the other hand, we have a dearth of class struggle in much of the world. You would imagine, you know, more class struggle in the United States would be a, a great thing. <laughs> and so we have to uh, now figure out how to deal with these, this divided kind of uh, position of class struggle in our conception of politics. This is a point that I think often comes up uh, when I, certainly when I discuss these arguments with others. Now, the, the, the second uh, limit concept, and this this is the, this is once again, it's the idea uh, in um, Althusser's uh, symptomatic reading is what is invoked in the book specifically. I I put it in terms of a problematic, in which there is the possibility of an of a new framework, uh, but it can only be expressed within the old terminology. And so uh, you get these kinds of conceptual voids. There are concepts are missing that are able to describe, uh, th th that would answer the necessary questions. And so they end up getting filled with the old concepts. And this is what I, uh, class struggle was actually such a concept in, this, in these circumstances. The other one was the seizure of power. And there is a very important connection here because the idea in revolutionary culture was that uh, the class takes the political form of the party and then the party becomes fused with the state. And so this model of the party state was absolutely central to the entire history of uh, the entire revolutionary history uh, of the 20th century. 
But this was precisely the problem of the Cultural Revolution and the, the, the uh, emancipatory possibilities that did come about in the Cultural Revolution were precisely about the idea that there can be politics which is independent of the party state. And the problem was the extent to which this was contained or transformed by the party state. And so the seizure of power, uh, which was absolutely basic to uh, the whole conception of revolution and remains a kind of aspiration for many people, the idea that we should, you know, uh, you often hear uh, Marxists today, socialists and Marxists today saying, well, we've had enough of this anarchism that is so skeptical of the state, and we need to go back to the idea that we should seize state power. Well, you know, um, there may be criticisms to make of anarchism, but we have to take seriously the fact that there is a long history of the seizure of state power, and we have to look at it seriously and derive lessons from it and uh, have an idea of what it means to advance in emancipatory politics and how that uh, affects the way we understand the state. And so once again, this, is, uh, this, is, this brings us back to the um, very complicated case of the Shanghai Commune, the change uh, of the Commune to the Revolutionary Committee, uh, and uh, others can speak about that if they want. Uh, but I want to emphasize the extent to which the seizure of state power, which is continuous with the logic of class struggle, this was a fundamental limit of revolutionary culture and the cultural revolution has the theoretical interest of uh, demonstrating uh, how there was a need for an emancipatory politics that put forth new concepts. And uh, Alessandro has described this in terms of egalitarian invention. And I think this is also an important point, which is that uh, we don't know what human equality looks like in the form of an actual society after a long history of class societies. So we, we cannot determine now uh, what a society that is based on human equality uh, would have as its characteristics, how it would be built. And so the only way to have an egalitarian politics is when you have the possibility that everyone has the capacity to invent uh, new forms of life, new concepts that uh, uh, are uh, new concepts of politics. If you don't have that, then there is, then we simply close down the possibility of egalitarian invention. So the idea of a politics which is independent from the party state is the condition of, of actually making the passage to a society that goes beyond uh, inequality, that, that, that goes beyond capitalism. So in a sense, what we see here uh, to sum up what I'm saying is that the theoretical interest of the cultural revolution is to demonstrate to us the limits of the classical concepts of revolutionary culture, which revolve around the inevitable victory, uh, the class struggle and the seizure of power. And to make it clear that uh, an, an emancipatory politics of the future has to make possible uh, egalitarian invention. And uh, so to me, these, this is the important uh, theoretical uh, consequence of this study. So that's the, those are my comments and I turn it now to Chris. You're muted. Yeah, that was great, Asad. And, and I, I think that that's a, that's a great agenda that you're setting, uh, you know, for a, a lot of our thinking and a lot of our work um, and, and the, and, and I think you, you express really well how Sandro's book um, prepares for and, and does some you know, ground clearing for that agenda. Um, I, I wanted to say, um, you know, before I got into the, you know, the, the, the sort of substance of my remarks that I, I wanted to thank um, the collective, the Red May Collective for organizing this panel and for organizing other panels um, that are engaging China and Asia uh, my experience over you know several decades has been that 
has been on the left, on the American left, really an insufficient attention uh, to, to China uh, and Asia as a whole. This is, this is changing. I mean, I think Assad is an example you know, of a, a communist thinker who's taking seriously the Chinese revolution. I think Colleen Lai is, is, is doing that work too. But it's still, it, there's still a lot that needs to be done. And, you know, I think David Harvey, Alberto Toscano, or other, or other people on the sort of non-Chinese left who really do the work and go through it, but plenty, plenty of them don't. <clears throat> um, and I think that should change. I, I, and, and, and that's why I hope that Sandra's book, Sandra's really important book, gets read outside of the China field and not simply by, um, you know, the China, ex I mean, all of us who are interested in the Cultural Revolution, of course, will read it. Um, <clears throat> my history with, with Sanjo and his work on the Cultural Revolution um, begins, you know, with articles, the early 2000s, but we met at a conference in Seattle in 2006, organized by Tani Barlow, uh, with Claudia and Sandro participating in that organization called Is a History of the Cultural Revolution Possible? And the the, the title of the conference is significant because I think what was being signified then was, was um, you know, not to, not to write the history of the Cultural Revolution, but to interrogate the forms of knowledge, the forms of theorizing that, that emerge out of the encounter with that period. And, and Badiou uh, was at that conference, Rebecca Carl, who's spoken here at Red May, she was also there number of other people. Um, and it was, um, you know, after Badiou's work on the Cultural Revolution had begun to appear in English. And there was a large contingent at that conference from the Revolutionary Communist Party, the RCP, that's, that's Bob Avakian's group. And they were taking very assiduous notes and reporting back to headquarters, you know, every evening. And it was, and their interest was was on Russo in Russo and 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 Badiou. and you know the RCP. For those of you who don't remember it, um, was not an uninteresting formation. I mean, it was. I mean, I think they struck a lot of us as as being pretty out there. But it was a it was a party that took the revolution part of that seriously, the revolution part of the work seriously, and. Um, and I remember, you know, some of the conference organizers were really worried about the presence of these people. Um, they were, I thought, really great additions to the conference. And, you know, the discussions I had, which continued after the conference with people who stayed in the party and people who didn't were really, really important. Um, so um, anyway, the Cultural Revolution, I, I, I wanted to, you know, Sandro's book, brings up and he mentioned in his remarks today the taboo on the cultural revolution and um and he brings the sort of freudian dimension of negation you know as as repressed desire into our thinking of that taboo but i would say that in the present in china you know we're really um not in the territory of taboo anymore not in the territory of repressed desire but rather in a, an emptying out of thinking altogether. And I think a, a good way to approach this and think about this figuration is a very popular novel a trilogy that um, came out in the last decade. It's been translated into English called The Three Body Problem, Santi by Liu Cixin. And this is part of this wave of, um, you know, this, this new wave of Chinese science fiction <coughs> Excuse me, and I think that if 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 you if 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 people want to understand the contemporary mythos of state capacity and the sort of ideological centering of the contemporary Chinese state on state capacity, and I think Sanjo described it in his remarks just now, you know what the ideological content of state capacity is, as well as the geopolitical content. The three body problem is really very useful. I think it, I think it gives more insight into contemporary state ideology than any other piece of literature I've read. Um, the plot is, you know, is, is a sort of alien encounter. Um, it sort of unfolds through game theory 
But one of the advancers of the plot is a, a character who, because of the Cultural Revolution, concludes that the extermination of the human race is the positive way forward. And so cooperates with this. I mean, she, she has a partner who's the son of a, he's a, a, an American son of an oil executive who concludes the same thing, you know, that the human race needs extinction, um, you know, because A, the cultural revolution showed it's the, the absolute evil of the human race. The other side, the oil industry did too. So, so the point is that the cultural revolution becomes something that is not available to thought by human beings, um, not negated, but, but, but not an object of thought. And um, the current regime, you know, the, the, the Xi Jinping regime in China, which is, you know, the sort of uh, champion of state capacity, state capacity in the thought of contemporary political theorists, Chinese political theorists, is, is the, 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 the content. Um, <clears throat> And starting around 2014, uh, you know, you, you began to get sort of the, the reappearance after a long absence of kind of political slogans on billboards and walls in China, you know, admonishing people to do this or do that, or, you know, uh, adhere to certain kinds of values. And what, what, what struck me about the kind of bourgeois Chinese reaction to this was how many people said, you know, I, it, it makes me afraid that the cultural revolution is coming back, that this is the return of the cultural revolution. And, and I thought it was a very bizarre reaction, uh, you know, to kind of equate authoritarianism um, with the cultural revolution, but that was the equation that was being made. And recently, you know, a, a, an important Chinese journalist, Yang Jisheng, his, uh, two volume history of the cultural revolution, which is based on archival journalistic document reading. Um, that was, that, that appeared a, a few months ago in an English translation. And the translators say at, at this moment, you know, where Xi Jinping is the sort of reincarnation of Mao, it's really important for this book to come out and we see the sort of dark side of authoritarianism and so that's, of course, another way of, and, and, and Sandro's book, I mean, an important reason to read Sandro's book is that the, he completely and thoroughly debunks this notion of, you know, Mao as authoritarian. In fact, it's, it's quite the opposite that, you know, as, as Sandro just said in his remarks, that the, um, that the kind of fomenting of and, 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 instituting debate and discussion was really what the cultural revolution was. And, and so this, this you know, historical turning around that's happened uh, in, 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 the, in the sort of popular view in contemporary China is really, is really very significant. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just enter into some thoughts on the book. Um, and, and, you know, I've been reading Sandro's work on the cultural revolution um, you know, for about 20 years and have seen um, certain formations sort of arise and then fade away. And I'm interested, you know, if, if Sandro cares to and, and maybe some reflections on, on, you know, where that came, I mean, the, 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 the journey that took. So, so I, I'd say one of the things that is, one of the things that has, has an, a shift of emphasis that's happened uh, in the book pub publication is that I, I would say the kind of Lazarus Baduian dimension is, is attenuated vis-a-vis -vis earlier iterations of the work. In other words, this Sylvain Lazarus, no Lazarus notion of saturation, the saturation of the party state form seems to me, you know, of, of, of less theoretical importance than it had been earlier. And this Baduian notion of the Cultural Revolution as the last revolution, um, I'll, I'll read from Badiou's essay. I mean, probably many people have read this. The Cultural Revolution is the historical development of a contradiction. On the one hand, the issue is to arouse mass revolutionary action in the margins of state 
of the state of the dictatorship of the proletariat, or to acknowledge in the theoretical jargon of the time that even though the state is formally a proletarian state, the class struggle continues. Um, on, so, so in, in other words, that the cultural evolution is a development of an unresolvable contradiction uh, between the party state and antagonism in general. Um, so to turn to Rousseau, uh, Rousseau's, Rousseau himself, I think what, you know, as Assad has said, what's important about this book is um, that is, is, is politics and thought, you know, that, that, that politics, the relation of politics and philosophy, politics, politics and thinking, I think performs in a, a really important counter to the kind of positivistic empirical work of which there is quite a lot on the cultural revolution and which is, which is growing. Um, I wanted to sort of do another, um, emphasize another methodological point for Rousseau and that is um, uh, philology. I think um, Rousseau is one of the, the few people to approach this period with um, and the work of the period philologically, a very um, you know close political reading, uh, a, a political close reading of texts, meetings, etc. And he's one of the few scholars that does this, and 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 and, and that is I, I would say that and and there's of course a tradition, an important tradition especially in Italy of kind of a philological Marxism uh, where I think we can locate Rousseau methodologically here. <clears throat> I wanted to read another passage from the book, which, which I, 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 would, I would say, you know, will illustrate to the listeners kind of where and what Rousseau is doing with politics and philosophy. And this is, in regard to the May 16th circular. And I, I feel this is kind of emblematic about the, uh, the methodology, emblematic of the methodology. By noting the class nature of truth, the circular's reply constituted a political philosophical tangle that led to an irresolvable impasse. We've seen that class struggle was a synonym for politics in the political language and culture of the time. However, it inevitably led back to a vision that placed the truth of politics within history, the history of class struggle. Mao was intent on reinvigorating the intellectual merit of politics and turned to philosophy for help. But every time an argument was grounded in a philosophical come political argument, the effect of intellectual revitalization eventuated in erasing the singular stakes at play in the political situation. The problem for which Ma could not find a solution was how to avoid the fusion, the suturing of philosophy and politics with all its anti-philosophical and in the end anti-political consequences. The category of class struggle fuses together philosophy, politics, and history in an inextricable web. And I think, you know, Assad gets at, you know, Assad's comments um, reflect on the issues raised here, as does um, dismissal, the notion of dismissal, the anti-political character of dismissal, as, as Rousseau and as Assad writes, um, come out of this, this inextricable web. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, I want to, um, I want to turn to, um, a notion that, that I think hovers through this book and might need some greater articulation. I think it was one of the, um, the sort of relay points between the Cultural Revolution and the global character of the 1960s. And that's the question of revolutionary subjectivity. Um, Subjectivity in general and revolutionary subjectivity. 
And, and I would say the, the character of the revolutionary uh, is one of the Cultural Revolution's important exports in, um, in Cuba, in the United States. I mean, I mean Guevarism you know, draws very strongly on this notion of the revolutionary, the, a, a, a Maoist form notion of the revolutionary. Um, the Black Panthers in the United States uh, the various movements in Detroit, you know, had this articulation of this figure, this new figure, and what that meant. Um, whether underground, you know, Colleen has talked about some of the, Colleen Lyons talked about some of the Detroit explorations of this. And I would say that, and, and, and you know, the other day in the Heinrich talk, uh, there was discussion of revolutionary subjectivity and its sort of inseparability to the revolutionary uh, with the revolutionary event, with eventalness. Um, and the Cultural Revolution in a certain sense was, was the laboratory for that. And I'm gonna to return to like the notion of laboratory later towards the end of my remarks, um, laboratory, school, et cetera. Um, you know, if you read, the, the, there's, there are scores of autobiographies of Red Guards, participants, in the Cultural Revolution. Most of them are from this kind of um, negation perspective, how I was led astray, you know, what the, the weird and bad things I did, etc. But one thing that comes up in, in many of these is a Red Guard, let's say in junior high school or high school or university, preparing to be revolutionary, make revolution, will embark on a period of study. You know, we'll be reading uh, Mao and Marx and Lenin, et cetera, you know, for several months and then, you know, go out and, and, and do the work. So this, this, the school, the notion, the school and the sort of generalization of the school that Sandro mentioned in his remarks, I think is part of this forging of, and, 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 and you know, an experiment in the formation of revolutionary subjectivity. Now, in the spirit of, in Sandro's philological spirit, I want to I want to just introduce another angle at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, or preferred before the Cultural Revolution, um, at its dawn, that that gets into this thematic too, and that is that is the that is Wuhan the the author of the play High Raid Dismissed from Office and the essay critical of that play created, and, and, and I think Sandra's book is really important to bring this out, created a nationwide discussion about revolutionary subjectivity, the, sub, the revolutionary character of the peasant, of, of the peasantry, you know, which had been brought into question by events in the early 60s. Now, Wuhan was a historian whose, whose most uh, important book was the biography of, and, and, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get into some, some older things now, but Wuhan's most important book was the biography of the first Ming Dynasty emperor. The Ming Dynasty is 1368 to 1644, and the Ming, um, the, the, the end of the Mongol dynasty, the Yuan dynasty, was marked by a very confusing array of uprisings. Um, and these in the 20th century revolutionary historiography are characterized, and I believe it's a correct characterization, as peasant uprisings. You know, this, these were these, these various movements at the end of the of the Yuan uh, in the 13 in the in the latter half of the 14th century uh, began in the peasantry and <clears throat> Wuhan wrote this biography of the first Ming emperor who was a you know who who led one of these rebellions and was victorious and instituted a state that had egalitarian dimensions to it. Mao was very interested in the Ming dynasty. Um, 
And Wuhan's book, Wuhan's biography contained a small passage about a, uh, one of the rebels at this time named Peng Yingyu, who was an early figure in a kind of millenarian peasant movement called the Red Turbans. And he, and he, and he describes Peng Yingyu as a professional revolutionary. And he uses this word, and this is not a common word in that book. And it's it, the mention of Peng Yingyu in the 1948 edition of this book is about one paragraph. And, and Wuhan says, he was a real revolutionary. He had a revolutionary spirit that was about establishing egalitarianism. However, because he wasn't the one to proclaim himself king or emperor or establish a movement, he disappeared in history. And his name doesn't go on and his legacy has not continued. And Mao wrote Wuhan a letter in, in 1948 saying, I want you to revise your treatment of Peng Yingyu. Revolutionaries should not disappear into obscurity. This is, this is an inappropriate conclusion. Um, <clears throat> Wuhan says, he, I'm, I'm, I'm just translating as I'm, as I'm reading this. He says, <clears throat> nowhere can you find any more records of what happened to this guy. He hadn't stood on his achievement and he didn't make a revolution in order to become a big official or a leader. That makes him a great person. And Mao says, that's, that's, that's not acceptable. Revolutionaries don't fade away. You know, it sounds sort of, we, we, we know what that sounds like. Um, so, so actually Wuhan, Wuhan did more research and was able to find in some kind of obscure uh, records what happened to Peng Yingyu. And Peng Yingyu, you know, it, it turned out he died in battle um, and he was, he was made a hero um, in, the, in the long history of Chinese revolution. So, so I would say that, 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 you know, Mao's interest in what is a revolutionary is an, is an activating dimension of this thing. And I think this, this, this idea of, of what is a revolution, what is a revolutionary and what does being a revolutionary mean has animated some of the more interesting discussion on the culture revolution. Um, Wang Xiaoguang, a, a Chinese scholar, Hong Kong based, has, uh, and, and you know, with whom I have disagreements, um, an important focus of him is to say that the Cultural Revolution, the, 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 the Red Guards were not revolutionaries, but they are rebels. So for him, this difference between rebel and revolutionary is really a, is really a key difference, a, a, a key element. So I think that, I think that, you know, the, the I think that the Cultural Revolution all, also gives us a perspective on this question on the being of revolution. And I hope I'm, I'm interested in Sandra's thoughts on that. And, um, you know, what we, what more we can do about it. You know, I, there's a book um, by a psychiatrist, Robert J. Lifton, and he's a psychiatrist in the tradition of Ferenczi and Melanie Klein, a kind of death drive, you know, sort of structured psychiatrist who, who, um, it's a book about the Cultural Revolution uh, called Revolutionary Immortality. And it's of course, you know, a book that is wanting to kind of uh, explain the excesses and the disaster of the Cultural Revolution. But I think it's exploration of the psychic qualities and the, and the temporal psychic qualities of revolutionary being, you know, could be turned in interesting ways and perhaps revisited. Um, I wanted to just end with, with two Two, two elements of the book, which I thought were interesting. And maybe I wanted to reflect uh, 
you know, further, further, uh, I get, get some further reflections from Sanjo on this. One of them, I, I think Assad has gotten into, so I won't say too much about it, which is experiment. And, you know, the, the, I, I, would, I would say one difference from the final iteration of the book and the earlier articles is that this, this the, the word experiment recurs more than, uh, more often. And the Cultural Revolution as an experiment is something that has considerable prominence here. And, and I, I, I wonder if we could all discuss, I think we'd all have something to say about this, um, discuss the, the, the nature of an experiment and what is an experiment and what is the political theoretical character of experiment and experimentation. Um, I was thinking about uh, Panayoti Sotiris's article, The Laboratory of Philosophy, Gramsci and Althusser, Assad's kind of, uh, touched on this um, experimentalism, sort of the concept of experiment. The other one, the other one I, I, I wanted to bring was in, in, in other sort of product of a kind of philological approach to Sandra's book is theater. Um, you know, there's there, at many points in the book, he refers to the scene, you know, this, 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 the concluding scene, this scene that, you know, scene occurs a lot and of course, there's a theatrical element that um, begins the book, which is, you know, the play, the high ray dismissed from office. And then we have, you know, this, um, we have it in, in, in his extended treatment of the end of the pluralization phase of the cultural revolution, when, uh, you know, representatives of the Red Guard groups are brought to uh, Zhong Nanhai for this discussion that then gets that gets recorded in great detail in a theatrical way. And Sandro mentions, you know, that he he stages that play, uh, a translation of that of that meeting in uh, uh, in Italy. And I, I I'll say that I began working on this too, a Chinese version of this you know, with my theater company. And then it just got, it just got undoable. I mean, because, you know, the, the, the apparatus around the cultural revolution in China is such that, you know, accessing, accessing this without too much process just became, just became hard. Um, but <clears throat> I, I, I think that this, this theater character uh, this theatrical dimension is, you know, provides some ways of thinking about um, the cultural revolution, and and I, I and and it also brings together, um, you know, I think some some thematics uh, of the political situation in general. <clears throat> so so you know, Badiou has has these reflections, uh, rhapsody for un, in rhapsody for the theater. And I, I, and, I, and, and I was struck by how many parallels there were from that to the Cultural Revolution as Rousseau presents it. Um, the Cultural Revolution um, unfolds within a changing politics of temporality. You know, what, what Assad brought up about probable defeat and um, you know, what, what the Cultural Revolution's time would be in relation to the probable defeat. Um, the, the, the immediate context in China of sort of stage skipping to communism, you know, the time of life, death of the revolution. Um, you know, I think that these are, these, these are problems that I think we could grasp in theatrical terms. Um, you know, but, but you says the, the complete temporal precariousness of theater, which is more easily grasped than that of, the, of politics for which the state's nearly atemporal solidity offers some premature consolation is disquieting to playwrights and directors alike. Um, <clears throat> and, and that theater self eclipses in performance. Um, but you write, theater which requires writing never ceases to unwrite itself. Neither the eclipse nor the contemplative consistency of pure duration saves it from its extended finitude, from its long shortness. 
So um, theater has a, 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 a virtuality that exists only in its coming or arriving. In other words, theatrical truth is evental. And I think that, that the, the theatrical quality of politics here um, is also maybe an approach, a useful approach to the temporality of this particular revolution. Um, I'll just, I'll end with another Badiou quote on theater uh, where he wants to say, not that politics is theater, but that theater is politics. It is true that holding a meeting in the midst of riots is theatrical, even down to the details. And I think Rousseau's, Rousseau's unpacking of that meeting just shows that. Everything though works in the other direction is it is theater in the circle of provisional repetition that figures the knotted components of politics. Theater is the figurative re-knotting of politics, and this is regardless of its subject matter. So I think that 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 you know if, if we if we consider the actuality of the cultural revolution, you know perhaps not not in the sense of drawing lessons from the cultural revolution for today, but but modes of experimental being suggested by not only the cultural revolution, but our theoretical, political encounter with the cultural revolution, these might be some useful rubrics. Um, thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, so there's so much that could be said now. <laughs> Let's have uh, Alessandro just give a brief response, but. Uh, I'm just saying to be brief so that we, because there are other people with many questions for you that are being sent online. So we want to get those two, you won't answer them too. But go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Both of you have made a, a very, a very deep analysis of, uh, uh, well, many questions that are still open questions also for me. So thank you very much for opening uh, new aspects also to issues that I have uh, uh, discussed in the, in, in the text. Uh, so uh, I agree that uh, the, the, the issue of, uh, of, uh, of probable defeat uh, is uh, um, really a sort of dissonance no, in, uh, with respect to the division of history as guarantee of, of politics, you know, the, the guarantee of victory. And is a dissonance because the 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 the, 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 the Mao's arguments about the probable defeat was not a capitulation. Was on the contrary, was the stimulus for 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 a, for a political mobilization. So how is the idea? How is possible a political mobilization that is not guaranteed by the certainty of victory? So this is totally new in the in the in the revolutionary culture. This was probably the major novelty, you know, the, the, the great novelty of Maoism of the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution was not guaranteed by, 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 by history. And probably in this sense, Wan Shao Guang says that they were rebels and not revolutionaries. <laughs> because revolutionaries in the sense of the Cultural Revolution make revolution because they are guaranteed by history. In the sense of the, well, the, 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 the rebels, you know, if we accept this distinction that I, I, I disagree with Wang Shao Guang on, on many issues, but, but we accept this, this, this distinction is that the rebels made politics without uh, an historical guarantee. So this, uh, uh, and on the other hand, uh, the, the, the problem that really was uh, the, 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 the key issue, the key, uh, in, in a sense, the, the, the main contradiction you know, between cultural revolution and the revolutionary culture, as Assad uh, um, said, was uh, the, the, the problem of the, the, the definition of the events with the, the names of the previous uh, uh, concepts, you know, the, the, the problem that uh, where I... I, I <clears throat> I use a bit of Althusser uh, theorization of symptomatic reading, but also I, I, I draw from, from Badiou the idea that, uh, 
the the what he calls in the last book the recouvrement, you know, the, the idea of the finitude, you know, <laughs> he calls the finitude. The, 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 I mean, the, the, there is a, a, a counter effect you know, of uh, uh, naming the, the, uh, the, the new uh, concept with the old names. You know? uh, uh, the, what is uh, not clear in Althusser theory, you know, there, there is the, 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 the counter effect, and this was clear. In, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in during the Cultural Revolution to, to, to call uh, the, the seizure, seizure of power you know, or even class struggle, what was happening uh, was not simply to use all the concept, uh, but is all the concept uh, retroacted you know, to, the, to, the, uh, to, the, to the, the revolution subjectivity is, is clear that uh, I, I, I fully agree with, with um, with uh, uh, Chris Connery that uh, the problem of revolutionary subjectivity and of subjectivity in general is, is a, a key point of, of the cultural revolution. But in this sense, so the, the, the counter effect of the retroaction of, of cultural revolution on, of, of uh, revolutionary culture on the cultural revolution, if we understand the cultural revolution as the, the set of new subjectivities. You know. So this is, uh, uh, and this is, was true not only for the for the Cultural Revolution. This was true for for the sixties in general. Eh? The the uh, in China was uh, uh, more evident, and probably to study China can help us to reconsider uh, elements of of the sixties of the global sixties. But probably because in, in general, there was this uh, retroaction of uh, the uh, old concepts, because, you know, the, the, for example, the, the issue of seizure of power you know, was not only uh, a Chinese issue, <laughs> also in Italy. For example, Potere Operaio, you know, Antonio Negri was a great uh, theorist. I, I have a great esteem of Antonio Negri. But it was uh, really contradictory, the idea that Potere operaio, the, the operaism, the workerism, was something that was beyond the old conception of uh, a working class. So it's something totally new. But on the other hand, potere operaio, what was the real uh, uh, political identity of workers? The power, not the, the decision of power. Potere operaio means uh, uh, working by. So there is a contradiction that, that is present in the revolutionary of the 60s, in Mao, in Antonio Negri, and in many others, is probably at the core of the, the, the issue of revolutionary subjectivities in, in China and in the 60s in general. So this is a short remark, but I really <clears throat> I am astonished by your analysis, not only of the book, but of the issues of that the book examines well beyond of my <clears throat> of my analysis. We have done a lot of work, and I thank you very much for your contribution to this discussion. Both, Both of you, Chris and Asa, thank you really very much. Okay, great. Uh, I think we could just keep talking. <laughs> so uh, there's so much uh, that this is all opened up, but I want to get to some questions that people have posed. Uh, let me begin. There's, an, there's another um, one of these, uh, these concepts like uh, class struggle and seizure of power, which is the, uh, that of the dictatorship of the proletariat. And one of the interesting uh, parts of the book uh, is the discussion of the campaign in 1975, the movement for the study of the theory of the dictatorship of the proletariat and factory study groups and so on. And so uh, there is one question which is about what, what this means for the concept, what, 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 what actually came out of this. And uh, I think a related question was about um, how does the uh, example of the cultural revolution change the way that we understand the state? Uh, how does it, and uh, what does it do to, let's say the Marxist understanding of the state and uh, does, it bring, does it bring about an anti-statist kind of politics? So that's, that's one set of questions. 
briefly uh, what what, uh, um, what struck us when we were students in 75 in China. So we remember very well uh, the, this campaign, uh, uh, the study movement on the theory of the Italian authoritarianism was that Mao's directive, you know, how it was called in that moment, were just a, 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 a big question mark. He did not gave, give any answer to what really is the dictatorship of the Preta. He just raised the question, what the dictatorship of the is, now, and he, he, he says, uh, <laughs> if we don't give a, 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 an, a, an answer to this question, it is very easy to, uh, to make capitalism, it's very easy to transfer. <laughs> So, so, so it was it there was a, <laughs> a repeated the idea that it was very easy to make capitalism and the one condition was that we don't know exactly what is the dictatorship what the dictatorship of paternity so in this sense they well, uh, uh, did they give a, a new uh, a, 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 a new concept to the state? Well, they tried a, a new path. For example, one uh, part of the, this study campaign was a, a reconsideration of the Marxist theory of the state, and uh, they published in. Uh, in the spring 75, a, a series of quotations that included Marx, Engels, Lenin, and not Stalin on the dictatorship of the proletariat. So they excluded the, the, the Stalin from the, uh, the, the, the vision so of the state. And on the one hand, they, uh, they, 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 they were the quite classical vision of, of the state, like in Lenin, uh, State and Revolution, for example. No? They, they, they followed the same, the same line of thought or like Marx's uh, uh, critique of Gotha program. The novelty was that uh, those elements uh, no, were not simply uh, related to the capitalist state, but uh, involved the nature of the socialist state. So one element was that between the capital and social and the difference was not so big. <laughs> it, it was not so big. In this sense, it was an experiment. And well, um, I agree with, with Chris Connery that uh, I, in, in this book, uh, I have much more focused on the, on the experimental aspect of the Cultural Revolution because reconsidering the issue really was a, a big mass experiment that involved primarily really the, the, the basic elements of the revolutionary culture. So in this sense, for example, the dictatorship of the proletariat was one, not, not by chance was a, the final issue, <laughs> the final uh, political issue of the Cultural Revolution was exactly this one. The, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, uh, the, in a sense, the, uh, about the the possible, it's interesting to to see the the, the possible uh, developments of cultural revolution if uh, there was not uh, the, the 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 coup d'état of seventy uh, uh, six. What was uh, Mao's last political project? You know, maybe one we, we should say something about uh, this because it, it could involve. Uh, also the theoretical issue of the state and of revolutionary subjectivity. In, uh, in late uh, 76, what Mao proposed was a, a mass debate on the Cultural Revolution itself, on the mistakes, on the uh, shortcomings, on the, uh, what did not work with the Cultural Revolution. And I think that in that moment in China, also among revolutionaries, uh, or among the rebels. Uh, this was a, 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 an issue that was strongly felt as a, absolutely necessary to understand what really happened during the, the, the for example, the, the period of factionalism and <clears throat> etc. 
And um, it's significant that ACO Ping absolutely refused this, uh, this, uh, this debate. No? So what really Mao was unable to, uh, uh, to, to make was uh, his unfinished project was really to reflect on the, uh, on the, on the cultural revolution itself. He, 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 the, the last, the, 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 state, the study campaign that you have quoted, uh, in my sense, was a sort of a preliminary step to reconsider the cultural revolution. So to reconsider the revolution itself. So to reconsider the framework of revolutionary culture about the socialist state, the, uh, the dictatorship and the proletariat, etc. And on the basis of this reconsideration, this rethinking, also to reconsider the cultural revolution itself. This could have given a great, <laughs> a great uh, development of a political thought or revolutionary politics, etc. And uh, it was really a great loss, maybe. Now, the great uh, failure, the great defeat of the Cultural Revolution was these, uh, um, these, 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 uh, um, the, the, the obstacle to uh, a self-reflection. And I think that the revolution in China were ready to do this one, this, this, well, uh, this self-reflection. And, and I, I think that, um, I, just to add a couple of things to that, I, I, I would recommend uh, Joel Andreas's book, a uh, recently published book, Disenfranchised, mm -hmm. because Disenfranchised, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's relatively uncommon um, for to pay attention to the 70s, to the early and mid 70s, you know, the sort of last years of the Cultural Revolution. And Andreas's book shows that, you know, a, a kind of practical social consequence of this attention to, you know, what is the dictatorship of the proletariat means that, that was, was visible in, in workers' power in the factory and workers, workers' authority in the factory and the uh, workers' political and, and the political character of factory work that Sandro gets into a bit. And, and on, the, on the nature, uh, I wanted to respond to the question about the state. You know, the, I, I think that if, if we want to think about a theorization of the state, qua state theory, that was not really the emphasis of the work that went on in the Cultural Revolution. That's, that's on the contrary, what's happening in contemporary China, where you have, you know, these, these, the, the sort of neo-authoritarian school like Wang Huning. And there you have, you know, very legible, I mean, discussions of the state and state capacity that are legible within, you know, sort of a thinking of the state. And, and I would say that in the Cultural Revolution, the, the, the state itself, you know, in, 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 in more legible state philosophy wasn't so much the preoccupation. I mean, that would be, that, that'd be my argument. So <clears throat> on the first uh, point, there was uh, actually a question from Stephen that is related to that about the factory. So if Stephen uh, may pose the question now. I hope my uh, microphone is on. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, uh, let me just, what you touched on, Chris, is what I was about to get at here with my question, which is uh, during the Cultural Revolution, what was the nature of work? That is, was work characterized by abstract labor and production of commodities, et cetera? And was there any attempt to change the nature of production, if this is so, or was the Cultural Revolution more about politics and um, and ideological questions and cultural questions, et cetera. I, I had included the state there, but you were already commenting on that. So was there any emphasis on um, uh, the question of uh, changing the, uh, the nature of production or was it already changed in that direction and they felt that other topics, more superstructural topics needed to be attended to. 
Fortunately, that Andrea Piazzaroli could not uh, participate to the to the, um, the, the yeah. webinar because she has worked a lot on the on the workers and factory during the cultural revolution, so, so she could have given more uh, precise uh, uh, answer to, to, to the question. I think that was not only ideological, the, the, the novelty of the cultural revolution was that the, 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 the issue of uh, how the uh, um, socialist factory was a really different from the capitalist factory. It was a really uh, strongly discussed, heatedly discussed uh, uh, at uh, different levels. Uh, one level was uh, that of the uh, bourgeois right, you know, that was quite classical bourgeois right in terms of Marx and Lenin's uh, classical uh, the the theories. But the, the idea that the bourgeois right was present in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the socialist society, but even in the factory organization, there was a really a great uh, uh, discussion on how the socialist factory could be different from the uh, capitalist factory. It was not given from, for granted that the socialist factory was different. On the contrary, was uh, during the Cultural Revolution, and in particular the last years of the, of the, of the study theory campaign about the dictatorship of the proletariat, was uh, um, an issue of, uh, uh, of, of, of debate, uh, uh, the, the, the question of to transform the socialist factory, how to transform the condition of the production, how to transform the division of labor in the factory, because the division of labor in the socialist factory was but basically the same than in the capitalist factory. So for example, the, the workers university that Philip <coughs> mentioned at the beginning <coughs> of this seminar were exactly an attempt to overcome the, uh, the, 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 the division of labor within the socialist factor. You know? The idea that the factory was, the socialist factory was not, uh, um, his, its superiority was not because of a, a highest level of production, but uh, because it was a school of, uh, I remember this definition, a school of communism. I remember in Shanghai, uh, I met the, the leaders the, uh, of the of Shanghai, um, a Shanghai uh, workers factory, the, the famous uh, machine tool factory. And they said that for us, our factory must become a school of communism. We wanted to overcome the division of labor. We, we, we start a process for, overcoming the division of labor. So in fact, the, the, the problem was, this was the novelty eh, of, of the cultural revolution in the factories. So there was not uh, also the, the, the division of what you said, the ideological, the economic, the political, uh, was, uh, was not so, uh, the, the division <laughs> was not so clear, the ideological and the political and the economic, uh, for example, in the factory where it was closed, closely linked together and uh, were not a, a, an abstract debate on what uh, the socialism ideas could be, how concretely the, uh, the, the socialist factory could differentiate itself from the capitalist factor. This problem was extremely important and extremely um, the, the hottest problem of the Cultural Revolution. Eh? And what really um, Deng Xiaoping considered the, the source of any possible disorder, eh? and on the contrary, was really the source of new thought, of new possibilities. I, I wanted to, Stephen. I wanted to give uh, uh, give you an anecdote on the on the socialist factory question. There was a film, very famous film in China, made in 1958 by the director Xie Jin, uh, and it was one of one of only three or four films in this in this kind of semi-documentary, kind of fictional documentary genre. And this film was called Huang Bao Mei. Uh, and, and that's the name of the, the heroine of the film. 
who's a worker in the, in the number 17 textile mill in Shanghai. Now that's a significant factory because that's the place where Wang Hongwen works and he became a leading rebel worker leader in Shanghai. So this 1958 film is a kind of Stakhanovite celebration of precisely the factory organization about which one could say, you know, there's, there's not a huge differentiation between the socialist and the capitalist factory. <clears throat> and she was a model worker. And I was at an event in, um, in 2012 that was about this movie and about model workers of this time. And she had started an organization after she retired of retired model workers giving motivational talks to young people across the country, across China. And, and she, she gave a talk and I was a commentator on it. And, and in her talk, she said, you know, what my life as a model worker shows is you just have to apply yourself and people in the factories should apply themselves and work hard and you'll do better. And then I asked her the question, I said, well, you know, do you, do you, do, did you find that there was any difference in working in a socialist factory and for young people today working in a capitalist factory? I mean, given, given you know, the sort of, uh, given surplus value exploitation, you know, does that change like what the meaning of industriousness is? And she said, no. And then, but after the meeting, various people in the audience came up to me and said, you know, she was a reactionary at that time in the Cultural Revolution, and she's a reactionary today. You know, and and and, and in the sort of after performance, after after talk discussion, you know, these people from the two sides of the Number Seventeen factory, you know, are sort of reengaging with this issue. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, so next, uh, the, I'm going to get back to YouTube questions, but there we have a question from Colleen. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, so um, this is such a great set of talks. Um, and I was wondering whether we could come back to um, some of the lessons of thinking with the cultural revolution that you know Chris has been exhorting us um, in the US to think more about um, for a long time now. Um, and um, extracting from some of the things that came out of uh, Assad and Chris's uh, extrapolations from uh, Sandro's book, um, Probable Defeat, uh, the emphasis on a kind of egalitarian uh, experimentation with revolutionary subjectivity, um, thinking about that um, as uh, by emphasizing um, the laboratoriness uh, or the theatricality of the scene through which such egalitarian um, attempts at overcoming the social division of um, labor uh, might be imagined. Um, how, how do we think about that now? Um, especially because there's some emphasis um, in the, U I guess in the US context where we're not at all um, very optimistic about state capacity, right? Uh, I, I mean, I appreciated aside your point about how the discussion of um, class struggle um, in the CR context in the 60s is, is, means something so different in the US context simultaneously where you need maybe more class struggle um, at the time, but then it was taken up in this way that seemed to imagine a kind of importation maybe of a socialist revolutionary context. Um, similarly now then, um, how do we think about um, the lessons drawn from Rousseau's interpretation of the CR um, for our current predicaments of what feels resonantly like trying to fight in the sense, uh, trying to imagine, um, you know, um, what a revolutionary subjectivity is um, in the context of probable defeat. Could I add something to that that question, which is, I mean, I'm re I really regret not being in Seattle, you know, and, and there being a room full of people because I, I know among the audience, you know, there's there's activists and people with really a lot of work in political organizing, et cetera. And I I wonder, and, and maybe Assad and Sandra could come in on this too, about, about your th thoughts. This is sort of, you know, adding to Colleen's same question. What about 
experimentation in the present. What would you say is the status of experimentation in the in in the present political scene? I mean, Assad's essay on Sandra's book uses pluralization and dismissal to explore some kind of some difficulties in the political present. I, th I thought it was an important essay uh, and useful essay. And I wonder if on the other side, on, on experiment, you know, what's the status of experimentation today in, in, in your views? And maybe, you know, if there are an audience, I'd, I'd be interested in people, you know, doing political work, how they think about that. You're muted, you're muted. No, maybe you can give more um, concrete answer to this question, to both, <laughs> the questions of both. I, would, I mean, um, what kind of experimentation is happening now, I think is a very difficult question to answer. And um, I, but, but I, I do, I mean, I register the difficulty about class struggle, but I do think that the lesson remains valid in, in this sense, which is certainly we need more class struggle with the United States uh, in the present. But one can assert this. <laughs> and does it mean anything happens? Does it mean that uh, class struggle would have any result that altered, uh, that altered the social structure or even improved uh, immediate conditions? It seems, you know, we have constant uh, abortive unionization drives. We have, you know, um, scattered initiatives. Um, sometimes they uh, make victories and certainly they're important to support. But I think what remains valid is this point about, first of all, emancipatory politics can't just be derived from the social category. The emancipatory politics has to be prescribed. It has to be uh, an affirmative statement uh, about equality and about a different kind of society. If you don't, and, and that comes first, I think. Once you have that, then you determine uh, how that maps on to the existing social categories. But you don't go the other way around, which has always been the assumption of Marxism. I think that- I agree, I agree, I agree. definitely I agree. No, because really class struggle the classes do exist. That is no problem. The class struggle do exist. It does exist. So, this is, the problem is how to overcome the class society. You know, the the the, the communism is it to abolish classes. So, is the problem of uh, to use class struggle to overcome uh, class divisions. And so, if we don't have a perspective beyond the capitalism. Uh, we can repeat the class struggle, but we can uh, obtain um, no result, in fact, or we can uh, uh, meet again the same, uh, the same traps of the class struggle before, because as I have discussed in the book, class struggle was an argument that was both openly and indirectly used against the, the new subjectivity, the, the new revolutionary subjectivities during the Cultural yes. Revolution. So the problem is how to understand the class struggle and the, the, the classes and class struggle in the light of a, 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 a a vision of a perspective beyond the how is possible a, 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 a beyond of capitalism and today is is the most difficult question. Right? Of course, we need more class class struggle in the sense that we need more politics. In the sense, I understand your paradox. No, we need more politics. And the politics, also, of course, passes through classes and the division of societies, etc. But if we don't have a new perspective of a of a of a society beyond capitalism, the class struggle cannot help us. Eh? Really, cannot help us in any. So it cannot help us politically. So what I, I, I analyze in the Cultural Revolution, I, I, I think that we can say that class struggle can also be an anti-political concept, eh? yeah. can become an anti-political concept. This is the paradox. And uh, could, I, could, I, uh, could I ask you a question, Sandro? Like, 
Okay, so, so to people who, who are outside the Cultural Revolution scene, there was a character named Yu Luo Ke. Yes, yes. Yu Luo Ke is mentioned briefly in Sandra's book. He has a, a bigger role to play in Wu Yi Ching's book, Cultural Revolution at the Margins. Yes. And he wrote a text that was originally approved and supported by the Cultural Revolution group, which was against um, you know, birth determinism. Yes. But in 1967, in 1967, he was arrested for this. Why, why do you think that happened, Sandra? Why, why in 1967 did the move against, uh, did, did that move in support of bloodline theory happen in the radical group? I, I, I couldn't understand that. Really, it's, a, it's, a, it's an enigmatic uh, moment because uh, the uh, Yul Walker's argument were very deep and very well grounded eh? because he criticized the, um, the, 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 the bloodline theory, how it was called, you know? and then there was a, not, not exactly the theory of class struggle was a, a sort of a biological classism. It was really an aberration and, and he uh, criticized uh, these, uh, these aspects. Then he was, uh, but in fact, the, the, the idea that what happened in that moment was only class struggle was in, in a sense, I, I don't want to be too much generic about the Euro curse case because it's, is a, is, a, is a horrible uh, moment uh, of, uh, of, of the Cultural Revolution. But was the effect, uh, the, the, count, the, 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 the counter effect of the, culture, of the revolutionary culture on the Cultural Revolution in this sense, no? So the, the, the fact that Yul Walker was not arrested, he was a uh, death sentence, he was, uh, he, he was killed eh, in the 67 or 68, yeah. something like that. So it was an horrible, uh, an horrible story because, uh, in fact, he had many, and he had a, a, a very positive effect in the pluralization, uh, the Eulocus mm -hmm. text, because he criticized the uh, so called bloodline theory that was an obstacle to the pluralization. So he, he played a very revolutionary role. So the, it's, it's, a, it's an enigma for me. I we well, I've read the, the Wu Jing's book and he examines uh, a lot uh, the, the the case of Yul Walker. I'm not sure that he gives a, a complete uh, answer to the enigma. He, no, he's, still, right, he, right. he's still enigmatic for me <laughs> also after. And he's the, probably Wu Jing's uh, uh, book is the the most extensive study on on on, on this. Uh, on, on, on this case, uh, well, I hope to read more. I know that in China have been published other books and the monographs about Yul Walker, but not really convincing. Eh? So I, there's a related kind of question that's come in um, related to a number of these themes, which is uh, about this question of the backgrounds of people uh, who are participating in the Cultural Revolution the relationship of factions to different class backgrounds and so on. So this, uh, the, the question uh, actually mentions Wu and also uh, Walder uh, to ask about, so the, the, the scholarship is showing, and Alessandro's book also says that you cannot uh, determine the factions on the basis of the social positions and backgrounds of the participants. And so the question is, uh, how does this change the, uh, first of all, Marxist theory, but then also the study of social movements? So you mean, uh, uh, sorry, I have not, maybe have not understood completely your question. Though. So the, the sense of your question, I agree that it is not uh, possible to find any social interpretation of factions. This is a... a, a so is this specific to the Cultural Revolution or can, do you think the broader conclusions can be drawn from it? Broader conclusion can be drawn. So, yeah, go ahead. No, because, uh, well, um, on the contrary, because, you know, the idea, the, 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 the danger of, of uh, the social interpretation of class, uh, of class concept, you know, is, uh, 
in, in a sense also a sort of uh, identitarianism. No? I know who I am and is the most dangerous illusion that uh, in not only in politics, but in subjectivity in general. I, I, so there is a problem of subjectivity in general. The subjectivity is not the identity. The identity is a, is a false subjectivity. And uh, the idea of a social determination of, uh, of, a, of a political subjectivity is really dangerous in this sense, is really a, a self-image and uh, really has been very dangerous, has been very dangerous in the 60s. So I agree that it's a broader Even. issue. Okay, uh, now we're gonna call in uh, Philip. Uh, are, you, are you able, Philip, are you around? I am around. And uh, I want if, this discussion is really incredible. It it provides a kind of bookend uh, to the whole month of Red May. Uh, one of the early discussions was uh, yesterday's tomorrow, a new book by Bini Adamsek, which tries to revisit the Moscow trials, another great taboo, but from a leftist point of view, to saying why do we need to go back there? And what can we find out? And, you know, I think it raises the general question, which has come up several times in this discussion. The, the second world has sunk deeper than Atlantis in people's consciousness. And yet, uh, over uh, many years, the space is outside of capitalism, uh, things sprouted up that are worth studying, as opposed to just the disasters. And yet, they've to totally disappeared even though, interesting enough, the rhetoric of anti-communism is still uh, the uh, optic within which the American state interprets uh, interstate rivalries out of a balance of power, uh, traditional balance of power, uh, 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 IR notion that's happening now with China and, uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, Russia anti-communism seems not to disappear. Uh, so, uh, but going back to this idea of a laboratory, uh, which I think is what uh, has come up again and again with uh, uh, particularly uh, Assad's intervention uh, and, and also the book, A Laboratory of Egalitarian Invention. Uh, um, it's, it's interesting to think that Marx uh, seems to have treated his approach to the economy in England as a kind of a laboratory. Notice how he continually postpones writing the book or rewriting it as some new crisis comes in and he says, well, wait a second, I haven't got it yet. I wanna, I wanna look, uh, I wanna look and see what happens so I can, can revise. Whereas when we think of the way Marx, Marxist political concepts have been treated, they've been treated as if they are uh, written in stone and needs simply to be applied in each conjuncture. I think that's partly what Assad was saying too, when he sort of said all of these things that we think about and talk about are put into question by these events and we have to look back at them and study. So it's almost like at this moment, we're in a, we should be in a perfect position to look at this world which uh, as Americans, uh, no longer threatens us in the same way, uh, at least the establishment. And yet uh, the approach to it has been the one of consigning it to the dustbin of history and pretending it's not there. Uh, so it's very important to go back and uh, to repeat uh, in Zizekian sense, to, to go and look at the possibilities, the roads that were not taken, to look at the disasters, but to find all of these uh, uh, wonderful possibilities that were not picked up and to try to expand our notion. And of course, that's what we're uh, dedicated to at Red May. The whole purpose of its existence is to look at these things. And one can find within American history and even American ideology, uh, uh, justification for doing so. If we look at pragmatism, for example, not as the word has been reduced to become, a kind of reconciliation to the meager possibilities of the present, 
but the notion of collective democratic experimentalism, which is what pragmatism at its best is supposed to mean. Try something out. If it doesn't work, try something else. You know, uh, capitalism <laughs> doesn't work. Try a little socialism, see how it works. The idea is, of, but of course, uh, it's designed in America to prevent any kind of experiment at all. Everything was fossilized at the moment of the creation of the constitution and there's no more experimentalism allowed after that. Certainly not political experimentalism. And that comes to the notion of theater, which everybody again brings up uh, both in relation somehow to the Chinese cultural revolution, but certainly to the 60s in and of itself as this period of almost theatrical experimentalism. Uh, uh, I was in those days an actor, so the notion of acting and politics were very close together in my mind. And if we think of the moments of the 60s of great theatrical experimentalism, they are the San Francisco mime troupe, uh, Peter Brook, uh, and what he was doing, which later became the theater lab and the living theater. What are they all about? They are essentially about throwing away the notion of interpreting a script and acting it out, but somehow kind of rewriting from below, from some point of departure. Uh, so the great moment of a New York theater was when the San Francisco mime troupe came to New York for the first time and in Central Park did a production of Machiavelli's Ruzante Goes to the Wars that anatomized the war in Vietnam in a way that just blew people's minds. Why do I bring up the San Francisco Mime Troop? Well, there's a connection with China here. Ronnie Davis, who was the founder of that troop, left the troop at a certain point because he thought the experimentalism hadn't uh, essentially had, had dried up. They were just kind of repeating themselves. And he looked for inspiration to the Chinese Cultural Revolution. There was this whole group of theater people that started to read Fan Shen by, is it William Hinton or something who wrote that, I know, and began to sort of think about, tried to rethink uh, how to do theater and how to do revolution, how to bring them together. Whether or not that was a, a, a road that led nowhere, uh, at least there was a road that was pursued. So uh, there were all these paths and roads that branched out from this moment that we have forgotten that we need to revisit in hopes of, as we invent our new ro roads to see sort of what works, what didn't, why it didn't work and to rethink all of these things. So I take Assad's uh, meta presentation out of Alessandro's book as a kind of programmatic statement for the left, a kind of meta statement and also for Red May. I mean, things don't map on to class, which even Marx knew when he wrote the 18th Brumaire. We're looking at all these things and trying to find the political concepts, the in insurrectionary concepts that work towards the future of which some part of the study and some part we're learning from what goes on in the street every day in America. So I think nothing could be more apt than this taboo subject at this moment to look at and devise a general approach to thinking about that crazy second world, which is gone, but at the same time, which, is, which uh, contains corners that we have never even looked at, you know, and we need to. Yeah, thanks. You have something to say? No, no. That's that. That's it, basically. That's my Sandra, statement. If I can say something that is uh, in line with uh, Philip's, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what he says about theater, uh, with Claudia now we are uh, involved in a theatrical project. Uh, we have uh, founded uh, a, a theater company, and uh, we are staging uh, a. A, a semi-comic drama that we wrote together that we will stay the focus uh, uh, is a sort it. of uh, of uh, 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 say is, uh, wait there, there is a group of workers uh, that uh, um, are uh, facing the great uh, issues of uh, 
revolutionary <laughs> theory. And uh, well, uh, all in, in a sudden. In, all in a sudden. So when we will have a, a, a sort of trailer of this uh, performance, we will send you and they will uh, see how we are involved in a theatrical experimentation, of course. Right. Mm. I think Philip will have you perform it for the next Red May. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. We, hope so. we hope so. We came to Seattle. <laughs> right. So this was a just a great okay. discussion. So glad that uh, we had this. This is the this is the crowd. This is the ending of uh, Red May for me. So I'm very glad to have this. Thanks to everybody for watching and everybody who participated. This is a great yeah. Time. I want to I wanted to thank the organizers and and uh, technicians, Red May Collective, and really. Uh, Sandro for the book. I think it's it's such a it's a great resource that'll continue to deliver. I think as it as it moves through the culture and through political discussion. So appreciate that very much. A absolutely. And uh, uh, goodbye to everyone. I do want to say one thing. I announced that Kathy Weeks, Michael Hart, and Veronica Gaga would be talking at three a.m in the morning. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, thanks to Mahim for catching me. It's 3 p.m. It's in an hour and 53 minutes. Uh, and uh, that, I assure you, will be worth watching because the subtitle is How to Change Everything. <laughs> uh, so uh, that'll right. sort of continue our theme here. All right. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you, everybody.